which they very much resemble in shape, throw up sand heaps as they burrow. Now the sand which they throw up is full of gold. The Indians, when they go into the desert to collect this sand, take three camels and harness them together, a female in the middle and a male on either side, in a leading rein. The rider sits on the female, and they're particular to choose for the purpose one that has but just dropped her young, for the female camels can run as fast as horses, while they bear burthens very much better. As the Greeks are well acquainted with the shape of the camel, I shall not trouble to describe it, but I shall mention what seems to have escaped their notice. The camel has in its hind legs four thigh bones and four knee joints, and its genitalia are turned towards the tail between its hind legs. When the Indians, therefore, have thus equipped themselves to set off in quest of the gold, calculating the time so that they may be engaged in seizing it during the most sultry part of the day, when the ants hide themselves to escape the heat, the sun in those parts shines fiercest in the morning, not as elsewhere at noonday. The greatest heat is from the time when he has reached a certain height until the hour at which the market closes. During this space he burns much more furiously than at midday in Greece, so that the men there are said at that time to drench themselves with water. At noon his heat is much the same in India as in other countries, after which as the day declines the warmth is only equal to that of the morning sun elsewhere. Towards evening the coolness increases till about sunset it becomes very cold. When the Indians reach the place where the gold is, they fill their bags with the sand and ride away at their best speed. The ants, however, scenting them, as the Persians say, rush forth in pursuit. Now these animals are, they declare, so swift that there's nothing in the world like them. If it were not, therefore, that the Indians get a start while the ants are mustering, not a single gold gatherer could escape. During the flight, the male camels, which are not so fleet as the females, grow tired and begin to drag, first one and then the other, but the females recollect the young which they have left behind and never give way or flag. Such, according to the Persians, is the manner in which the Indians get the greater part of their gold. Some is dug out of the earth, but of this the supply is more scanty. It seems as if the extreme regions of the earth were blessed by nature with the most excellent productions, just in the same way that Greece enjoys a climate more excellently tempered than any other country. In India, which as I observed lately, is the furthest region of the inhabited world towards the east, all the four-footed beasts and the birds are very much bigger than those found elsewhere, except only the horses, which are surpassed by the median breed called the Nisean. And gold, too, is produced there in vast abundance, some dug from the earth, some washed down by the rivers, some carried off in the mode which I have but now described. And further, there are trees which grow wild there, the fruit whereof is a wool, exceeding in beauty and goodness that of sheep. The natives make their clothes of this tree wool. Arabia is the last of inhabited lands towards the south, and it's the only country which produces frankincense, myrrh, cassia, cinnamon, and ladanum. The Arabians don't get any of these except the myrrh without trouble. The frankincense they procure by means of the gum styrax, which the Greeks obtain from the Phoenicians. This they burn, and thereby obtain the spice. For the trees which bear the frankincense are guarded by winged serpents, small in size and of varied colors, whereof vast numbers hang about every tree. They are of the same kind as the serpents that invade Egypt. And there is nothing but the smoke of the styrax which will drive them from the trees. The Arabians say that the whole world would swarm with these serpents if they were not kept in check in the way in which I know that vipers are. Of a truth, divine providence does appear to be, as indeed one might expect beforehand, a wise contriver. 
for timid animals which are a prey to others are all made to produce young abundantly, that so the species may not be entirely eaten up and lost, while savage and noxious creatures are made very unfruitful. The hare, for instance, which is hunted alike by beasts, birds, and men, breeds so abundantly as even to superfetate, a thing which is true of no other animal. You find in a hare's belly at one and the same time some of the young all covered with fur, others quite naked, others again just fully formed in the womb, while the hare perhaps has lately conceived afresh. The lioness, on the other hand, which is one of the strongest and boldest of brutes, brings forth young but once in her lifetime, and then a single cub. She can't possibly conceive again, since she loses her womb at the same time that she drops her young. The reason of this is that as soon as the cub begins to stir inside the dam, his claws, which are sharper than those of any other animal, scratch the womb. As the time goes on and he grows bigger, he tears it ever more and more, so that at last, when the birth comes, there is not a morsel in the whole womb that is sound. Now, with respect to the vipers and the winged snakes of Arabia, if they increased as fast as their nature would allow, impossible were it for man to maintain himself upon the earth. Accordingly, it's found that when the male and female come together at the very moment of impregnation, the female seizes the male by the neck, and having once fastened, cannot be brought to leave go till she has bit the neck entirely through. And so the male perishes, but after a while he's revenged upon the female by means of the young, which while still unborn, gnaw a passage through the womb, and then through the belly of their mother, and so make their entrance into the world. Contrarywise, other snakes, which are harmless, lay eggs and hatch a vast number of young. Vipers are found in all parts of the world, but the winged serpents are nowhere seen except in Arabia, where they're all congregated together. This makes them appear so numerous. Such, then, is the way in which the Arabians obtain their frankincense. Their manner of collecting the cassia is the following. They cover all their body and their face with the hides of oxen and other skins, leaving only holes for the eyes, and thus protected go in search of the cassia which grows in a lake of no great depth. All round the shores and in the lake itself there dwell a number of winged animals, much resembling bats, which screech horribly and are very valiant. These creatures they must keep from their eyes all the while that they gather the cassia. Still more wonderful is the mode in which they collect the cinnamon. Where the wood grows and what country produces it, they can't tell. Only some, following probability, relate that it comes from the country in which Dionysus was brought up. Great birds, they say, bring the sticks, which we Greeks, taking the word from the Phoenicians, call cinnamon, and carry them up into the air to make their nests. These are fastened with a sort of mud to a sheer face of rock where no foot of man is able to climb. So the Arabians, to get the cinnamon, use the following artifice. They cut all the oxen and asses and beasts of burden that die in their land into large pieces which they carry with them into those regions and place near the nests. Then they withdraw to a distance, and the old birds, swooping down, seize the pieces of meat and fly with them up to their nests, which, not being able to support the weight, break off and fall to the ground. Hereupon the Arabians return and collect the cinnamon, which is afterwards carried from Arabia into other countries. Ladinum, which the Arabs call Ladinum, is procured in a yet stranger fashion. Found in a most inodorous place, it's the sweetest scented of all substances. It's gathered from the beards of she-goats, where it's found sticking like gum, having come from the bushes on which they browse. It's used in many sorts of unguents, and is what the Arabs burn, chiefly as incense. Concerning the spices of Arabia, let no more be said. The whole country is scented with them, and exhales an odour marvellously sweet. There are also in Arabia two kinds of sheep worthy of admiration, the like of which is nowhere else to be seen. The one kind has long tails, not less than three cubits in length, which if they were allowed to trail on the ground would be bruised and fall into sores. 
As it is, all the shepherds know enough of carpentering to make little trucks for their sheep's tails. The trucks are placed under the tails, each sheep having one to himself, and the tails are then tied down upon them. The other kind has a broad tail, which is a cubit across sometimes. Where the south declines towards the setting sun lies the country called Ethiopia, the last inhabited land in that direction. There gold is obtained in great plenty. Huge elephants abound with wild trees of all sorts and ebony, and the men are taller, handsomer, and longer lived than anywhere else. Now these are the furthest regions of the world in Asia and Libya. Of the extreme tracts of Europe towards the west I can't speak with any certainty, for I don't allow that there is any river to which the barbarians give the name of Eridanus, emptying itself into the northern sea, whence, as the tale goes, amber is procured, nor do I know of any islands called the Cassiterides, tin islands, whence the tin comes which we use. For in the first place, the name Eridanus is manifestly not a barbarian word at all, but a Greek name, invented by some poet or other. And secondly, though I've taken vast pains, I've never been able to get an assurance from an eyewitness that there is any sea on the further side of Europe. Nevertheless, tin and amber do certainly come to us from the ends of the earth. The northern parts of Europe are very much richer in gold than any other region, but how it's procured I have no certain knowledge. The story runs that the one-eyed Arimaspi purloin it from the Griffins, but here too I am incredulous, and can't persuade myself that there is a race of men born with one eye who in all else resemble the rest of mankind. Nevertheless, it seems to be true that the extreme regions of the earth, which surround and shut up within themselves all other countries, produce the things which are the rarest and which men reckon the most beautiful. There's a plain in Asia which is shut in on all sides by a mountain range, and in this mountain range are five openings. The plain lies on the confines of the Chorasmians, Hyrcanians, Parthians, Sarangians, and Thamanians, and belonged formerly to the first mentioned of those peoples. Ever since the Persians, however, obtained the mastery of Asia, it's been the property of the great king. A mighty river, called the Aces, flows from the hills enclosing the plain, and this stream, formerly splitting into five channels, ran through the five openings in the hills and watered the lands of the five nations which dwell around. The Persian came, however, and conquered the region, and then it went ill with the people of these lands. The great king blocked up all the passages between the hills and dikes and floodgates, and so prevented the water from flowing out. Then the plain within the hills became a sea, for the river kept rising, and the water could find no outlet. From that time the five nations, which were wont formerly to have the use of the stream, losing their accustomed supply of water, have been in great distress. In winter, indeed, they have rain from heaven like the rest of the world, but in summer, after sowing their millet and their sesame, they always stood in need of water from the river. When therefore they suffer from this want, hastening to Persia, men and women alike, they take their station at the gate of the king's palace and wail aloud. Then the king orders the floodgates to be opened towards the country whose need is greatest and lets the soil drink until it has had enough, after which the gates on this side are shut and others are unclosed for the nation which of the remainder needs it most. It's been told me that the king never gives the order to open the gates till the suppliants have paid him a large sum of money over and above the tribute. Of the seven Persians who rose up against the Magus, one in Tophernes lost his life very shortly after the outbreak for an act of insolence. He wished to enter the palace and transact a certain business with the king. Now the law was that all those who had taken part in the rising against the Magus might enter unannounced into the king's presence unless he happened to be in private with his wife. So Interfernes would not have any one announce him, but as he belonged to the seven, claimed it as his right to go in. 
The doorkeeper, however, and the chief usher forbade his entrance, since the king, they said, was with his wife. But Interfernes thought they told lies. So, drawing his scimitar, he cut off their noses and their ears, and hanging them on the bridle of his horse, put the bridle round their necks, and so let them go. Then these two men went and showed themselves to the king, and told him how it had come to pass that they were thus treated. Darius trembled, lest it was by the common consent of the six that the deed had been done. He therefore sent for them all in turn, and sounded them to know if they approved the conduct of Interfernes. When he found by their answers that there had been no concert between him and them, he laid hands on Interfernes, his children, and all his near kindred, strongly suspecting that he and his friends were about to raise a revolt. When all had been seized and put in chains, as malefactors condemned to death, the wife of Interfernes came and stood continually at the palace gates, weeping and wailing sore. So Darius, after a while, seeing that she never ceased to stand and weep, was touched with pity for her, and bade a messenger go to her and say, Lady, King Darius gives thee as a boon the life of one of thy kinsmen. Choose which thou wilt of the prisoners. Then she pondered a while before she answered, If the king grants me the life of one alone, I make choice of my brother. Darius, when he heard the reply, was astonished, and sent again, saying, Lady, the king bids thee tell him why it is that thou passest by thy husband and thy children, and preferest to have the life of thy brother spared. He is not so near to thee as thy children, nor so dear as thy husband. And she answered, O king, if the gods will, I may have another husband and other children when these are gone. But as my father and my mother are no more, it's impossible that I should have another brother. This was my thought when I asked to have my brother spared. Then it seemed to Darius that the lady spoke well, and he gave her, besides the life that she had asked, the life also of her eldest son, because he was greatly pleased with her. But he slew all the rest. Thus one of the seven died in the way I've described very shortly after the insurrection. About the time of Cambyses' last sickness, the following events happened. There was a certain Orates, a Persian, whom Cyrus had made governor of Sardis. This man conceived a most unholy wish. He had never suffered wrong, or had an ill word from Polycrates the Samian. Nay, he had not so much as seen him in all his life, yet notwithstanding he conceived the wish to seize him and put him to death. This wish, according to the account which the most part give, arose from what happened one day as he was sitting with another Persian in the gate of the king's palace. The man's name was Metrobates, and he was ruler of the satrapy of Daskelium. He and Orites had been talking together, and from talking they fell to quarrelling and comparing their merits, whereupon Metropates said to Orites reproachfully, Art thou worthy to be called a man, when near as Samos lies to thy government, and easy as it is to conquer, thou hast omitted to bring it under the dominion of the king? Easy to conquer, said I, why, a mere common citizen, with the help of fifteen men-at-arms, mastered the island, and is still king of it. Orites, they say, took this reproach greatly to heart, but instead of seeking to revenge himself on the man by whom it was uttered, he conceived the desire of destroying Polycrates, since it was on Polycrates' account that the reproach had fallen on him. Another less common version of the story is that Orites sent a herald to Samos to make a request, the nature of which is not stated. Polycrates was at the time reclining in the apartment of the males, and an Acrian, the Tyan, was with him. When, therefore, the herald came forward to converse, Polycrates, either out of studied contempt for the power of Oroides, or it may be merely by chance, was lying with his face turned away towards the wall. And so he lay all the time that the herald spake, and when he ended, didn't even vouchsafe him a word. Such are the two reasons alleged for the death of Polycrates. It's open to all to believe which they please. 
What's certain is that Oroites, while residing at Magnesia on the Mayanda, sent a Lydian by name Myrsus, the son of Gyges, with a message to Polycrates at Samos, well knowing what that monarch designed. For Polycrates entertained a design which no other Greek, so far as we know, ever formed before him, unless it were Minos the Knossian, and those, if there were any such, who had the mastery of the Aegean at an earlier time. Polycrates, I say, was the first of mere human birth who conceived the design of gaining the empire of the sea, and aspired to rule over Ionia and the islands. Knowing then that Polycrates was thus minded, Aroites sent his message, which ran as follows. Aroites to Polycrates thus saith, I hear thou raisest thy thoughts high, but thy means are not equal to thy ambition. Listen then to my words, and learn how thou mayst at once serve thyself and preserve me. King Cambyses is bent on my destruction. Of this I have warning from a sure hand. Come thou therefore and fetch me away, me and all my wealth. Share my wealth with me, and then, so far as money can aid, thou mayst make thyself master of the whole of Greece. But if thou doubtest of my wealth, send the trustiest of thy followers, and I will show my treasures to him. Polycrates, when he heard this message, was full of joy, and straightway approved the terms. But as money was what he chiefly desired, before stirring in the business, he sent his secretary, Myandrius, son of Myandrius, a Samian, to look into the matter. This was the man who not very long afterwards made an offering at the temple of Hera of all the furniture which had adorned the male apartments in the palace of Polycrates, an offering well worth seeing. Aroites, learning that one was coming to view his treasures, contrived as follows. He filled eight great chests, almost brimful of stones, and then, covering over the stones with gold, corded the chests, and so held them in readiness. When Myandrius arrived, he was shown this as Aroites' treasure, and having seen it, returned to Samos. On hearing his account, Polycrates, notwithstanding many warnings given him by the soothsayers and much dissuasion of his friends, made ready to go in person. Even the dream which visited his daughter failed to check him. She had dreamed that she saw her father hanging high in air, washed by Jove and anointed by the sun. Having therefore thus dreamed, she used every effort to prevent her father from going, even as he went on board his Pentaconta, crying after him with words of evil omen. Then Polycrates threatened her that if he returned in safety he would keep her unmarried many years. She answered, oh, that he might perform his threat, far better for her to remain long unmarried than to be bereft of her father. Polycrates, however, making light of all the counsel offered him, set sail and went to Aroites. Many friends accompanied him, among the rest Democedes, the son of Caliphone, a native of Crotona, who was a physician and the best skilled in his art of all men then living. Polycrates, on his arrival at Magnesia, perished miserably, in a way unworthy of his rank and of his lofty schemes. For if we accept the Syracusans, there has never been one of the Greek tyrants who was to be compared with Polycrates for magnificence. Aroites, however, slew him in a mode which is not fit to be described, and then hung his dead body upon a cross. His Samian followers, Aroites, let go free, bidding them thank him that they were allowed their liberty, the rest, who were in part slaves, in part free foreigners, he alike treated as his slaves by conquest. Then was the dream of the daughter of Polycrates fulfilled. For Polycrates, as he hung upon the cross, and rain fell on him, was washed by Zeus, and he was anointed by the sun when his own moisture overspread his body. And so the vast good fortune of Polycrates came at last to the end which Amasis, the Egyptian king, had prophesied in days gone by. It wasn't long before retribution for the murder of Polycrates overtook Orites. After the death of Cambyses, and during all the time that the Magus sat upon the throne, 
Aroites remained in Sardis and brought no help to the Persians whom the Medes had robbed of the sovereignty. On the contrary, amid the troubles of this season, he slew Mitrobates, the satrap of Dasculium, who had cast the reproach upon him in the matter of Polycrates, and he slew also Mitrobates' son, Cranaspes, both men of high repute among the Persians. He was likewise guilty of many other acts of